you and see. Thanks. I always forget that piece. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the first webinar of spring 2021 for the CCC OER webinar series. And we're really excited to start in the classroom looking at um, some examples of the amazing work faculty are doing to make their course materials and design more inclusive. The plan for today um, is, will, oh, I should introduce myself, sorry about that. Um, so my name is Suzanne Joachim. I am part of the CCC OER webinar subcommittee. And I'm thrilled to be able to moderate a panel today of three instructors that are doing some amazing work. We'll be looking at an example of digital storytelling, um, an example of how OER was made more inclusive, and um, an example from humanities in decolonizing the curriculum. As we go through, each presenter will share their section, and at the end of each section, we'll have time for Q&A. So if you want to put your questions in the chat, I'll collect those and we'll have, have some time to answer those um, at the end of each section and then potentially at the very end of the session as well. Our panelists for today, we have um, Amy Caratini, who is an anthropology faculty from Montgomery College in, um, in the USA. Mandeep Gruel, who is a biology instructor from Butte College in California and Lori Beth Larson, who's English and reading faculty and the OER lead at Central Lakes College. Before we get started, a quick introduction to CCC OER, um, if you're new to our work. So the, the mission of CCC OER is, is here, as you see it on the slide, to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, to support faculty choice and development, to foster regional OER leadership, and to improve student equity and success. CCC OER has 90 members across 34 states and 16 member -wide, uh, system wide memberships. So when the slides are shared, um, you can click here and find out who all of those members are. Okay, and with that, I am going to turn the slides over to Amy. I need to stop sharing, and um, Amy will start her section. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Suzanne. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, as was already mentioned, my name is Amy Caratini, and I teach uh, anthropology at Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. And today I'm going to talk to you about digital storytelling and specifically how I've implemented it in my Anthropology 201 Introduction to Sociocultural Anthropology class. And for me, the value of digital storytelling is that it really fosters or nurtures multiple viewpoints or multiple perspectives on the, anthropo on the anthropological concepts that we're learning. And I find that students really enjoy applying their lived experiences to their field work and their research, and it comes out in the digital stories. So I've enjoyed using this as a platform for student engagement. So there's six different points I want to share with you about digital storytelling and how some of the strengths, I believe, of this, uh, this open pedagogical practice for engaging students. The first is that it's based on experiential learning. And uh, in anthropology at Montgomery College, one of the signature assignments that we have is a participant observation-based project where students are encouraged to investigate a cultural phenomenon. Uh, Pre-pandemic, this meant an in-person experience. I had students looking at Starbucks uh, as a third space to gather or the Genius Bar at Apple or a farmer's market. Um, in, in the pandemic, they've been doing more virtual ethnography where they've been looking at online communities, um, uh, webinars, events online to do this assignment. And to begin with, the assignment is a paper where they do some field work exploration, they take notes, they interview people, and then they write a paper about that, connecting it to some of the anthropological concepts that we've been learning. Near the end of the semester, they then take that paper and they have the opportunity to turn that into a digital story. 
And what I really love about that transformation from the paper to the story is that they have to think about communicating what they learn to a more general audience. And so they get to process the information in a new way. And uh, you'll see up here, I, I took some screenshots from digital stories. Uh, my, my student Yasmin, she was looking at ethnic groceries in Walmart to look at how people were accessing foods that were familiar to them or a close um, cl foods that could be close to that uh, from their countries of origin. And uh, she, she looked at you know, what they were drawn to. And then I have another example here of uh, Drag Queen Story Hour. One of my students looked at several of these events that happened online to understand themes and topics that kept coming up. And then a third example that I have down here is uh, the Vietnamese Association um, at the University of Maryland. One of my students went there to see their family night. And she looked at all the different vignettes and um, representations of what it meant to be Vietnamese American. So really interesting. Uh, so this leads to my second point, which is that there's a lot of flexibility and students really appreciate the choices that they have. When it comes to the digital story, the first thing they do is they create a script and usually two to three pages. And they have to really think about not only what they learned through their, through their research, but how it connects to their own life. And what I like is they have so many choices between the script, they also have to think about what they're gonna overlay with that in terms of images, sounds, if they're gonna include other voices. You can see from the example that I have here, she wrote like a paragraph for her introduction and then underneath in italics, she started to sort of put what she might use as overlay or as images that go with her, her um, writing here. Um, so this really gets the students thinking about repackaging the information. And uh, there's many platforms that you can do this through. Montgomery College has the Wii Video platform. But students can also do this in Adobe, they can do it with their phones, uh, they can turn it into a YouTube video. So there's lots of different directions, but the idea is that they are the director. A third point is that it really encourages this collaborative knowledge production. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're discussing different aspects of sociocultural systems. We're looking at marriage and family, how they organize society, religion, how we feed ourselves, economics, um, a, whole, a whole host of subsystems that organize our society culturally. And they take that knowledge and they apply it to what they're learning in the field and they create their own representations to understand the anthropological concepts. And in doing that, they're really, you know, teaching me to see it in a new way as well. Uh, the first pair of images that I have up here come from a digital story on law and order. I had a student who was really interested to look at how we represent law and order through entertainment and how that's a product, a cultural product of how we see it in general as a society. And what she did is she overlaid these dioramas that she did with Legos to kind of mimic scenes from the show which I thought was really creative. But the main point she was trying to make is that there's these really monolithic understandings of like the prosecutors being the good guys and the defense attorneys being on the negative or bad side and how the police perceive them. And so she created these dioramas to sort of speak to that. And um, in the second set of images below here, I had a student go to the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian, and she looked at this exhibit on women in the STEM fields and um, these depictions of them with facial hair to sort of subvert spaces where maybe they hadn't felt welcomed. And she used these images um, to overlay with her experience in, in communities that were near and dear to her, like equestrianism and being a student herself interested in the STEM fields and as a woman. And so they both like really made me rethink or understand these concepts in new ways as they connected it to their own experiences. A fourth point I have here is about student reflexivity. And, uh, when they had to reframe their narratives from the paper to the digital story, I also wanted them to include themselves and in how they intersected with the research. 
And uh, this is my student up here in the corner, Agan, who uh, looked at culture and sustainability in the Washington DC metro area. And uh, one of the things uh, about where we're located as a campus, we're about 18 or 19 miles from the White House. But within those, those miles and surrounding area, there's some really vastly different landscapes. And so she was capturing like what it was like to be in the urban center versus the, the rural part that's not so far away versus the suburban parts. And trying to understand from a stakeholder lens what those different communities were like. And she looked further at um, grassroots organizing and um, this, this one community that had a Cedar Creek Strong, which was a community that was organizing for social change and how it was engaging immigrants. So, you know, I really enjoyed how she was able to put those multiple perspectives together. And uh, circulation of knowledge is my fifth point, and it kind of builds on the last in that people are anticipating their audiences with the digital story. They're thinking about how the public is going to respond. And in so doing, they're trying to understand different stakeholder responses, and uh, they're anticipating what those responses are going to be and integrating them into their narrative. And Nyreen was a student of mine that was looking at the effects of the pandemic on higher ed when we went online. And what she did is she reached out to uh, students that were all over. So she was trying to look at what the international student experience was. So she interviewed someone that had been in the US but went home but still remained in the class. I can't remember what country at the moment, but how she was getting up at different times of day to enter class because of the big, the big time difference and, and what her experience was. And then she looked at another student at Montgomery College, and then she looked at students that were um, at, other in, in, at other institutions in the US to try to look at the similarities that were connecting their experiences and the differences. And the last point that I have here is about developing purpose. One of the biggest things I noticed about the transformation from the paper to the digital story was how um, committed they were to answering that so what question of why the research mattered and um, you know why people should pay attention or why it would be important knowledge. And uh, this is my student, Ava, who was looking at theater culture, both from the inside, how actors were experiencing it, and then what the benefit is to, to those who go to the theater. And she had, you can see here, one slide within her digital story. That's why, why is this important? Which is, of course, one of my most important aspects of anthropology is how can you take this skill set and this perspective and apply it to everyday issues or problems? And this is how she closed her story, which I was I, I really enjoyed. It's it's poetic, but it also speaks to what it means to be part of the shared human experience. Uh, she says, performance takes our realities and turns them into visual, musical, and poetic creations that reveal to us elements of our world of which we had been unaware while performers meet a variety of people and live a myriad of different lives with each new role they conquer. This in turn allows them to become empathetic and more conscious individuals in society. Theater isn't merely an outlet for me to express and discover myself, but I now see it as a documentation of and a reflection on how far we may have come as a society and how much farther we should strive to go. So, you know, they wrote me some great papers, but the stories themselves showed me another aspect of how they had understood the knowledge and they invited me to be a participant in that when I watched their stories. The last slides that I have here are examples. Um, I know when you get to go the, the, through the slide deck, you might wanna see some of these, which range from between five to eight minutes. Um, so I've put a number of examples here if you'd like to explore them. Um, but that's, that's all I have for now. I, I enjoyed sharing that with you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks, Amy. That was just an amazing example of open pedagogy. I much appreciate your sharing those, those stories. 
Uh, we have time for a question. So if someone wants to post a question in the chat or uh, raise their hand, now is a good time or we can do that at the end as well. So question in the chat about what tools your students used. So I mentioned the WeVideo platform, which is tremendous. I really love it. At Montgomery College, we have a, a digital storytelling community of practice. And um, you know, it's a really rich, vibrant community that's actually connected to the Smithsonian and the Paul Peck Humanities Institute. So in that sense, it's really nice it, it, it's free access for the students and it's a software that allows them to drop their narratives, their sound files, their video and kind of create, a, um, just create the digital story based on those tools. But certainly I've had students who wanted to interact with other modalities and Adobe Acrobat is another one. Some people like to make them on their phone and transfer them to YouTube videos. And I, I know there's other platforms that I'm not as well versed in. Um, it, it, I think Apple has a platform too. So you just have to kind of look around, but I would recommend the Wii video um, if your school is able to access that. Wonderful, thank you. And if folks have other questions, uh, post them in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to them at the end. If you don't have your chat open, there's a great link that Una dropped in there uh, for the podcast with Amy and one of her students sharing uh, the student experience. It, it's a wonderful podcast if you have a few minutes to, to listen to that. And at this point, we're going to turn it over to Mandeep, who's going to share her um, how she changed the textbook to be more inclusive. Mandeep, all you. Oh, Mandeep, I think you're um, muted still. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, my name is Mandeep Grewal. I teach biology at Butte College, and that is located in Oroville, California. And in this pre presentation, I'll go over um, how we made our OER textbook more inclusive. Um, so I'm going to be talking about human biology textbook. Um, so I did not know, you know, how to start and where to start. And then I did, didn't even know that my book was not inclusive. Uh, so in our college, we have training for faculty where we go and uh, we listen to uh, different perspectives. Um, so I, I took this training where, you know, present, pre presenters, they said that, you know, it's very important for students to see the, themselves represented in the textbooks. Uh, so I did not know where to start. So I joined a task force. Uh, so we have a task for, force at Butte College. Um, and, sorry, guys, I'm a little nervous. I'm doing it the first time. Um, so the first thing, um, I, I did not know where to start, so I had to come up with a survey. So with the help of the task force, <laughs> so I came up with nine uh, questions. So here I'm only uh, displaying three questions and the feedback that I got from faculty and my friends. Uh, so if when you get access to these PowerPoint slides, uh, if you click on the survey questions, you can get the get access to all nine questions that we created with the help of the task force. Okay, the first question was, um, so I asked people, I asked the um, people um, if when they go through my textbook, if they could um, tell me how inclusive my textbook is from one to four, one to five. And I was actually amazed that a lot of people gave, uh, you know, four, but there was also one. So the range was one to four. And I got a little worried and I was like, okay, so this need, this book needs some work. 
Uh, so the second question was how well do the images reflect our student body? What recommendations do you have for making the images more inclusive? So I got very good feedback. I did not get a lot of surveys back. I only got five back. So some of the examples that I, I, I have up here, uh, so most of this, uh, most of the survey takers, they said that I should make, I should add more diversity. And uh, they told me that a lot of uh, images in the textbook was even like if I had a, a person of color, but that person was, um, you know, represented as white passing. Uh, and they, they recommended that I use they pronouns, like not everywhere, but somewhere in the book. Um, and they also told me that some of the illustrations that I used, for example, of uh, the reproductive organs, the outline was uh, represented as white and the skin tone was white. And I should add more women scientists. Uh, I should add more videos where they're not all white people. There's some uh, people of color. <laughs> and uh, one of the question, uh, where in the book should LGBTQ identities and perspectives be added or more clearly articulated? Uh, so they, you know, um, my friends and my colleagues, they told me that I should include reproductive strategies of other species that we should not think that uh, there's only male and female and they only they can have, um, they can reproduce together and they can have um, and they also asked me to add more intersex representation. There are some individuals who do not do not have typical genitalia or chromosomes. Uh, they also asked me to not include, like not call the sex chromosomes, sex chromosomes. Uh, they also told that females also have testes. The, the fem uh, males can also menstruate. Uh, they asked me to delete breastfeeding. So some terminology like that. And they also, um, told me that assistive reproductive technology can only be cannot only be used for heterosexual people. They can be, can also be used uh, by same sex couple to expand their family. And they uh, they told like I should not use opposite sex. So they did not know what that meant. So some people, you know, what what do you mean by opposite sex? Um, so if you want to get the full list of all the questions, uh, they will be found. So there will be a link in the chat. Um, so this is the book. If you click, when you get the access to these PowerPoint slides, if you click on the title of the book, you'll get link to the book. So this book is hosted on LibreTexts. Uh, it's an OER book. Uh, it's a free of charge. And this is the most used book on LibreTexts. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, Suzanne, uh, can you open your, can you still see the PowerPoint slides? I think I clicked on the link. Uh, yeah, we can see the slide, but not the textbook. Were you trying to show us the textbook? No, no, no. I just, by mistake, okay. I clicked on it. Sorry. <laughs> don't we, we can still see the slides that's great thank you okay okay so after looked at after i looked at the survey questions and the feedback i read my book one more time and the book you know you guys don't read everything just pay attention to the first sentence um and this is one of the case studies in one of the chapters of the book uh so i read the the case study with the you know, from a different perspective. And I read, okay, Melissa is a common name, common American name and wearing high heels. Okay, so we think, we always think that only females wear um, high heels. And this is a person, this is a picture of a person who has white skin. So most of the examples in the textbook was looking like this I was like okay so I don't have all white students I also have students of color and I myself is a person of color so I had some experience uh you know from personal life uh that I could add but I just needed more information on LGBTQ so that was the reason I joined LG um, our task force um so this is what the book looked like before and then I 
I changed it to this, like some aspects or some case studies in the textbook have been uh, transformed after looking at the, the survey. So if you read the first sentence again and also look at the picture, you can see that I've used a not American name, Am Amari. So I was hoping that people would go online they would look up the name and they would try to figure out where this person came from, what their person's culture is. And I also used a they, them pronouns and I had my colleagues read it. They had a little hard time reading through and they could not relate a single person with the they, them pronoun. Uh, so they, uh, so I had to add a little disclaimer that this person uses they, them pronouns so that would be easy for them to read through uh, the textbook. Uh, and if you guys are interested in like where I found these images, um, if you click on these, this is how you um, attribute open sources images. And I have a full slide of different sources where you can find images. Um, and then um, last year, what happened? My house, uh, uh, you know, uh, got fire. Um, caught on fire and I had to find a rental house uh, there was like no house because of the fires around our um, ha like our, around our area so it was hard to find a rental house so it was we were renting house through insurance company so insurance company was paying a lot of money to renters um, so we found a house the guy signed all the paperwork and then we went to see the house and he said oh okay so I forgot one thing I was like what and he said uh, could you cook Indian food outside so when you cook Indian food inside it can it can you know all the smoke can get into the uh, the house and it's hard to get the, the smell out and I was like so disheartened but that was the only house we could get. And I, I thought like, you know, many people have that kind of experience. So I needed to add that in the book. So here, um, so I so I added my own perspective uh, in the book and you guys can click on these uh, links if you wanna find the image where I got this image from. Uh, the other things I've added, you know, when you have a person um, with a disabilities, like we always have an image of a person on a wheelchair when we're talking about a wheelchair or we're talking about disability. Um, and here, you know, I, you can put a picture of a person with a disab disability or, or a person of a color where we're not actually talking about the appearance of the person. Um, so here's one example. So here I'm talking about carbohydrates, uh, what cotton candy is composed of. And here's a person eating cotton candy and you guys, you can get the access to the link, uh, the source of the, uh, the image uh, over here. And when I got to reproductive system, so that was the hardest chapter to make, you know, uh, to, to fix all the things that I had in there before. Uh, so this is, this is what a chapter, you know, page looks like. And as I was uh, making the chapter inclusive, I was having a very hard time finding information on LGBTQ uh, community. Um, so I had to add a little disclaimer that most of the information that I added is heterosexual of like you know, females and males, like, and there was not enough information about LGBTQ. So I defined that acronym and then um, I tried to include as much information as I could find in the, in the book and also in the other chapters. Um, and then here, Actually, I'm going to take a little, I'm, I'm going to take questions. I'm sorry about all the little nervousness because this is the first time I'm doing a big presentation. But if you have any questions, uh, so I can add, um, Suzanne, is, do we have time for a question right over here? We do. Um, we have a couple of minutes and, um, and this was just wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing just the, the transition of this book from kind of the typical textbook that we've all seen to something that's much more inclusive um, and also more more accurate from a biological standpoint, right? Um, so just amazing work, getting lots of accolades in the chat. Um, Amy shared a great link to um, sources for finding more diverse images. So if, if folks have the chat open, definitely worth clicking. I know I have that page bookmarked. It's, it's hard to find some of these images. So thank you for, for sharing that. 
And um, Mandeep, I believe your next slide has some places to find images as well. Yes. Yes. Um, and the, the main question that came up was about who took the survey. So was the students or faculty that, that took the survey? Uh, it was the faculty and the, and the task force uh, staff and librarian. Um, so I gave it to a variety of different, uh, so it was in English instructor, biology instructor, librarian, and then uh, task force members. So it was not students. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to get more information, like more feedback from students. So I haven't taught students with this book yet myself, but other people have. Uh, so I hopefully I'll get more information from students on this. Wonderful, thank you. So thank you for, for sharing. And if folks have other questions, um, you're welcome to put them in the chat and we'll come back to more questions at the very end. At this point, we're gonna turn it over to Lori Beth. Mandy, that was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing that resource as well. So I am Lori Beth, and I um, teach at a small college in Brainerd, Minnesota. I teach English and reading and um, a variety of things. So I am... Um, took my humanities class, I teach uh, humanities, and um, attempted to uh, decolonize it. So this was my original. The original textbook I had was The Humanities Through the Arts. I believe the newest version of it, I think they come out with one every year, is about $170, or you can rent it. I think an online version for $70. I like the textbook. But as, as we all know, um, the humanities in many American colleges are about um, Homer and Shakespeare and Jane Austen and primarily um, my search for OER materials came up with this kind of thing. I'm just kind of making fun here. This was the humanities one-on-one -on -one OER that I found and he even makes fun of old dead Greek dudes and uh, medieval philosophy, the Renaissance, um, pretty Western. And this was another one that I found. It did include uh, humanities from Africa, South Asia, China, Japan. But um, as I was looking at this, and a, primarily a chunk of my time in read reworking this humanities um, OER was looking at, I didn't want even a comparison, right? Between Western humanities and then everything else, right? I didn't want to start from that point. Um, I grew up in Papua New Guinea, just to give you a little background on myself. I grew up in Papua New Guinea. These are my, this is my neighborhood. Um, and then I, I have a degree in ethnomusicology from the University of Hawaii. So um, my background is, um, is not in uh, like English literature or um, Western humanities. So here are some of the questions I started trying to figure out. So how do I incorporate the Renaissance if students need to know about this? Um, which philosophy do I include? because I am not a philosophy major. I don't really have a background in philosophy. What about art appreciation and music appreciation? Since I do have a background in music appreciation, but it's certainly not Western uh, music. How do I present religion? Um, and should I follow like a history of the world? Should, is that how I should put this together? I just was not sure. So I went back to the basics. And I did, you know, your backwards design. And I said, okay, so um, this course meets a goal area six, which is humanities and fine arts, and it meets a goal area eight, which is global perspective. So if I'm going to do that, and if this is the course that I'm going to teach along with a number of other instructors, can I actually meet the course specific outcomes? 
The only one I was, the, the, all of the outcomes were, I could meet them, except I wasn't sure how to summarize the major characteristics of various eras and arts and humanities, which era and which area of the world, because they, uh, were they going to learn about the Renaissance and Baroque? I wasn't sure. So I decided to totally delete Western humanities from this course. And uh, that was a little scary. So um, as I introduced students to this OER and to the course, I said, I've taught it as a typical humanities course, but I've expanded it. And we're going to start look by looking at what makes us human. And we can't really do that if we only look at one tradition, one history, and one culture. I do have the link to the um, first book I put together. I'm in the process of converting it to press books, and I'll get that up there soon. But it is published in Opendora, um, our Minnesota State Repository. So I found this fabulous resource. It is not, it is open, surprisingly, amazingly open. And it is a, a four and a half hour uh, YouTube video called Human. And um, I, I'm not, Ar Jan Arthas Bertrand collected stories from more than 2,000 people around 60 countries. And I asked students to watch this. This is the first thing they do. And it's little interviews with a black background. And he asks them a variety of questions. And then I ask students to, to respond by making their own video. That was a little complicated. I need to take some advice from um, Amy's digital storytelling in order to make this go better. But that's where I started. And then each section has essential questions and students respond to those so that's the assessment part um, what is changeable how do what is how we know about the world shape the way we view ourselves what does it mean to grow up um, these questions they ask throughout the book so here's an example i know this slide's a little hard to see but this is um philosophy and each of these sections, I really need to uh, expand a little bit, but I think I have a start on the basics. So this is uh, Julian Baghini, and he's actually not a philosopher, but he is um, a journalist, and he looked at uh, looks at philosophy from around the world, from um, uh, different uh, points of view. And then, um, again, religion, we just take a very general overview of religion, take a look at the five major world religions, and then we grapple with some questions like, where do I come from? And how do I live a life of meaning? Uh, language, this, this needs definitely some more, as, as I said, but here's some of the essential questions that we ask. Um, how is language used to manipulate us or empower us? And I ask students to respond to these. And uh, uh, literature was really fun. I actually found a translated Korean novel. Um, instead of taking a look at heroes from um, a, a simply a Western perspective, this um, Korean novel uh, takes a look at a hero from a, um, a Korean perspective, and it is an open resource. So it was, it was pretty fun to find that, and, and I copied the whole thing into the OER. Uh, visual art, again, um, Ted Ed has a ton of lessons, and so I've taken like um, Friedrich Frida Kahlo and a variety of lessons from um, TED Ed uh, talks. And I included culinary arts, which um, came about uh, from um, 
a, a taste taste the nation i believe we i watched taste the nation during my our our summer pandemic <laughs> time at home and started thinking about how culinary arts are really important to what makes us human and so i found um was absolutely wonderful that the smithsonian went open and um found a bunch of um uh, ideas on culinary arts. In this section, I also ask students to uh, cook something and share it with everybody. Um, we don't, we can't actually share in person because we're all uh, remote still, but they um, shared a picture of their food and their family trying it. And it could have been comfort food from their own historical or their own traditions, or it could be something completely different. Um, and music, of course, since that's my background, again, uh, typically I ask students to um, take a look at the resources I have, but then um, uh, expand and their knowledge of music and traditions and uh, respond to the essential questions. So what's next in my process here? Some parts of this OER are pretty slim. It needs a lot more. I need a better rubric, and I loved hearing about Amy's um, digital storytelling because I think that would be a nice way to incorporate students um, internalizing their lessons. And um, and I, then I would like to know how to incorporate their work into the OER. And so, um, and I also, um, now that I've completely deleted Western humanities, I would like to pull some back in, um, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. So that's uh, that's that's where I'm at here. And I will stop sharing now. And I think we have time that's for some questions. Great, Lori Beth. Thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, and what a what a bold move to just completely redesign how a course is put together. That's just um, amazing and brave and wonderful. Um, and finding so many, I know you said that you're looking for some more resources, but um, Liz was sharing some of the ones that you shared and there's just such a wealth of, of great content. So thank you for, for sharing that. And hopefully everyone um, knows how to save chat. Um, it's definitely worth doing this time around um, because there's lots of great links. So if you, if you don't know how to do that, but where you type in the chat, there's three little dots. You can save it that way and make sure you have all of these, um, these resources that were shared. We did have a question um, for, for you, Lori Beth, and then we'll take broader questions for, um, for the whole uh, group, the whole panel, and we have time, so um, we have a, a chance to get some good discussion going. Uh, the question was about how did you get open licensing for the TED-Ed content? A link to it. So my OER um, a, just links to that TED-Ed lesson. Yeah, I embed some of the TED Talks um, because they have open licenses, but I link to the TED Ed lessons, yeah. Yeah, um, and that, that is a good way to, to use resources that, that um, aren't fully open so you can't um, remix link out. And there was a, a good question, I think can go to any of our panelists about how this can apply to other disciplines. So in the chat specifically was a question about how would you apply this to an Italian class? But in, in general, how could you add inclusivity to different types of classes, maybe focusing on language classes or others? Ms. for anyone. I, I can offer, um, well, first, just listening to Lori Beth, you know, it's amazing what you're doing. Um, creating these spaces for students to understand our shared humanity. Uh, and definitely with the digital storytelling, like there's so many ways that you can apply it. Uh, I put in the chat the link to the digital storytelling community of practice at Montgomery College. So you might see some different examples, but I know that in the humanities, like a lot of the writing professors or English professors are using it for students to tell more personal narratives. And I feel like in the social sciences, they're sort of using the digital storytelling as a way for students to communicate their research to a more general audience and to be reflexive about it, almost like mini documentaries. 
So I think that there's many ways you can take that form and use it for a specific purpose, but maybe the, um, the thread that connects them all, at least in my mind, is that the students are putting something of themselves and their lived experiences in each of those narratives. Um, Lori Beth or Mandip, do you have anything to add to kind of strategies to apply this to different disciplines? Yeah, I I um I was looking at the chat too, and I think applying to different disciplines. Uh, we're doing a music and world culture and um, a philosophy class, uh, converting those to OER now as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I was, I was, I uh, sent this OER to my, my colleagues who also teach the humanities in, in CLC and, and I haven't had any responses yet to, uh, you know, how come you deleted, how did you, how come you deleted Western, Western humanities from your course? So I'm not exactly sure what, I, how I would respond um, to that criticism yet um, but that's that's how we're going to go about uh, taking a look at philosophy and music and world cultures is by let's take a look at the whole whole piece now I don't I don't I don't have a very good answer for that it, it, it can yeah it's, it's interesting when you start presenting things in a way that's different from what what we've always presented. Um, I know with the, the biology book, we, we had traced that too a little bit is, oh, you're doing it differently than, than the usual. Um, and at some point you just have to go, yes, yeah, yes we are. Um, yeah. So the, I, the, I, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, please. yeah. Um, I think, you know, sometimes uh, when we are just asking people like who are in our own discipline, like we don't know what to change. So it's it's good like to, to change other disciplines. It's, it's, it's good to ask other people, ask students, because I just did not know how to change some of the sentences like, okay, sex chromosomes, those are just sex chromosomes. So I did not know where to find information. So those people like other people can tell. Um, so this is how, you know, because I, um, I asked people from English, right? So from task force. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a great strategy, reaching out to colleagues in other disciplines to get that, that other viewpoint. Because, yeah, we do get kind of focused um, blinders in our own way of, of seeing things in our discipline. Great idea. Thank you. So a, a couple of questions, I think, touch on the idea of how do we start, right? So how did you begin this? These are all big projects. What's a good first step? Um, and I know one, one person was asking about, was there grant funding? Was there other, or did, just kind of how do, how do you take that first step? I know uh, that with us at our college that there was a grant. I don't think that was enough to cover everything, but that has enabled the work for digital storytelling because first they hosted a series of workshops on what it was. And actually I'll look it up and put it in the chat. They invited someone who that's like one of their main areas of research is applied storytelling to come to the college. He's Italian, um, Antonia Lacori, I think her name is. And she gave several workshops on what digital storytelling is and how you could use it. And then they purchased the software, which all I have to do is send my students to the center and they get an account, a free account. And then um, they also have an internship program. So they're training students to be interns and I can invite them to come to my class to work with the students and show them how to use the software. So I would say all of that is an amazing support to help the project. It helps me not to have to be the sole arbiter of everything from the tech aspect to how you design a script to how you think about it, the connections to anthropology. We have a um, we have a, a OER community of practice here at CLC, which um, um, so we offer uh, faculty stipends to convert their their um, coursework to open educational resources, and we have about nine people doing it. 
this year. And matter of fact, this year we're using student OER specialists to help out. Um, so that's that comes from the state. We're working towards making that sustainable and getting um, our our college to uh, fund some of it. But uh, that's kind of how we we work with developing OER. I, th I think money <laughs> incentive is the big thing. I I think college has to give incentive and once you're in it, you know, now I was, I started working on this book when I was a part-time instructor. So my goal was to get a full-time job. So I just start working on it without, um, you know, with a little bit of stipend, but once you work on something, you just, just kind of like own it, then you just want to work on it. Um, I think money is the first step. Um, um, so now it's just like I've been working on it for, you know, Suzanne and I, we've been working on this book for about five, almost five years. So then it just becomes your thing. And then you, then other people start asking. Uh, and then you, um, then you just, you know, you just become part of it. Yeah, I, um, and I think Amy Hofer was in the chat, uh, said time and money, right? How do you, how, what's the hardest thing? And, and yeah, this, um, it does require support from from either the colleges or larger entities um, to to help get it started. So thank you all for um, for those wonderful questions. Um, just a a few wrap up slides about what's coming next. Um, these are the webinars coming up for this semester. You can see the the uh, March is Open Ed Week, and we'll have a slide for that specifically. April is a uh, community college K-12 connection um, webinar about how those two connect. May 12th is finding professional development resources for OER adoption and creation. Um, and that may provide some of the, the answers that you know, folks were asking about how do you get started, right? So how do we advocate so that our larger entities can support faculty doing this kind of work? Um, and then in June, we're still working on the topic for that. So uh, Open Ed Week. Liz, do you want to share a little bit about that for us? Sure. Um, all right, you can, yeah, okay. So the, the Open Edu Education Week this year, uh, which is or, uh, organized by um, Open Education Global, the parent organization for CCC OER. Um, you can now submit your events. Um, you can also go to the site and see archives of different events that people have done in the past and um, you can find resources that people have shared. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, um, you should go ahead and check that out. And next slide. So um, CCC OER, um, in the past we've done a lot of webinars and we figured, you know, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So we're gonna have one kickoff meeting that's live on Monday and you can register for that on the spring webinar page. And then we're going to have themes um, each day. So it'll be, you know, asynchronous um, on different social media platforms. Monday is talking about OER basics. Tuesday, we'll be talking about an ongoing program that CCC OER is doing about re regional leaders of open education. Wednesday is student OER awareness. We'll have open pedagogy and equity. And then Friday, we'll be talking about global um, open leadership and the CCC OER um, leadership, specifically our executive council. And if you're a member, you can find out more about that and participate. Uh, next slide. Um, and just to stay in the loop, we keep a list of um, upcoming conferences on our website um, and if and our community email, if you're not on that, we'll announce our webinars and we have a, it's a great community of practice for educators. And we also have um, EDI blog posts and student OERs and backstories. Uh, next slide. And, um, <laughs> and, and that's, yeah, I just put the image credits in there, but um, yeah, if you want to get in touch, uh, there's Una Daly's email. She's the director of CCC OAR and um, I'm the manager of community practice and I run the, the CCC OAR Twitter. Um, so I think that's all, all for me. So if anybody has any more questions.
questions. We've got a few more minutes, so I'll turn it back over to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, so if, um, if folks have questions, we do have some time for additional uh, discussions with our panelists. I'm also going to copy some of these uh, links from the slides that, that Liz shared so that if you want to get to the webinar series that's in the chat, um, joining the email list. And then the EDI blog posts are really great reads. Um, and there is information there about places to find uh, more diverse imagery as well. There was a great blog post that, that started um, actually a good chunk of this work for, for some of us. So I have stopped searching the chat. I'm so sorry. If there's any questions and you want to raise your hand or repost them, um, oh, Sophia, yes. Yeah. So the, the link will take you to where the slides are being shared. Welcome. If there aren't any questions, thank you all for, for joining us. It was um, really great. Thank you for the presenters as well. Like, this was just wonderful information, and I appreciate your taking the time to share them with us. And thank you for all the great questions in the chat, folks. Um, and it was great to, to be with everyone today.